your turn to 1 Corinthians 4. Chris, you guys stand up just for a sec. Chris and Rebecca, most of you know them. And they're headed east. And they're on deputation. Our young people that sent out of our church. And so where are you headed for a, like a base for a while, Chris? North Carolina. All right, so they'll be there. And, and just pray for them. They'll be visiting churches back there. Thank you so much. Be praying for them if you would. They're leaving this week. And this is their, their last Sunday with us. They might be here Wednesday. But just want to remind you to be praying for them. They can get their support and get there onto the field soon. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in your Bible. And we're going to look at a, a for several passages tonight. And if you'll follow along, we're going to start reading in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4 and look down at verse 9. Let's stand for a moment as we read the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 9. You follow along as I read. And I think, uh, for I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. For we are, fo we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise. Now Paul's being a little facetious here with these arrogant Corinthians. Uh, in verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Father, bless these moments as we look at the scriptures and thank you for a Bible that teaches us. And, and Lord, there's a way to live the scriptures and a place that it fits in our daily routine. And so I'd ask for your help, please, tonight, that you'd bless what goes on this evening and that you'd protect us and bind off any forces of darkness and the confusion, the distractions, may it all go, that goes on tonight, honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We have in a, uh, a world that we're in, we're all concerned about us, uh, unless you're Joe Grimes wearing that hair and mustache. Um, most of us are concerned about us. We're concerned about our, what people think of us, and, and it's natural. And, but you know, and it's not just church people. Uh, you ride with a group of guys in a bike gang. They're all very carefully aligned alike. You don't see people that have Harleys riding with people who are riding the uh, fast little, you know, whatever these other things are. Um, they're, everybody's really concerned about fitting into their little group. Um, you know, if, if you're, a, if you're a, a person who likes to do off-roading, there's a, a culture that goes with it. There's a culture that goes with skateboarders and all. Um, and, and we do have a tendency, we want to fit in. We want to, we want, and peer pressure can be a good thing or a bad thing. But I'd like tonight to talk to you about a little phrase I heard Lee Robertson say over and over and over and over and over about the importance of dying to self. About getting over you, getting over me. Anybody who's been to boot camp of any branch of the military knows it's not about you. It's about the cause, it's about the work. And if you've been anything successful, in most areas of business, you're going to have to get over you, and the business is the big thing. Many, many people have had to learn to get up in front of people who are not comfortable doing it. People have had to change the way they handled things. But, but Paul, I want you to look through here real quickly. We're going to look at some other verses. But Paul is writing to the Corinthian church in verse 9, and he says, God set forth the, us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. Um, Paul said, we, we are appointed. It's just assumed we're going to die. It's assumed we're going to be killed. And we're appointed here. We are a spectacle to angels and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake. Now, Paul's putting it up there. Look, if we as the apostles are willing to live a life of dying and a life of, of self-denial, then maybe you shouldn't act like you're so good, Corinthian church. He says in verse 10, we are fools, but you are wise. We are weak, and you are strong. If the leader is willing to humble himself, perhaps the follower ought to step up. We go to John 13, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And I don't mean to turn there. You can sometime, because we're going to be in Romans in a minute. But um, Jesus had the disciples around that last supper, and 
he went aside and he took off that teacher's robe or that, that uh, clothing of distinguished um, position. And he just took a towel and wrapped it around him. He knelt down with a basin and he washed the disciples' feet. And he said, if I, your master or teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Now he's not talking about, I know there's churches you wash feet and um, that's odd. <laughs> But there are. I mean, they come to church, ladies over there, men over there, wash each other's feet, get the shoes and socks back on, come in. I heard one preacher, he said, our church wash feet once a month. I was wondering, why didn't we do it every week? They all are dirty. Um, that's not what Jesus was saying in that gospel, because he said, what I do now, you don't know. But you will know hereafter. Now, they knew he was washing their feet. He was teaching them this thing of servitude. He was teaching this thing of, you're not too important. You're not too important to empty a garbage can. You're not too important to clean a toilet. You're not too important to uh, help a little child's class. You're not too important to change a tire. None of us are anything. We just are here as servants. In verse 11, he says, even at this present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're naked. We're buffeted. We have no common uh, certain dwelling place. We labor, working with our own hands. We're reviled. We're persecuted. We suffer. Paul said, look, I'm willing to go through this. I'm the uh, apostle. I'm the one who started your church. I'm the one who won people to Christ. But I have no problem suffering. Now get over you. Verse 13, we're defamed. He says we entreat. Uh, we've been defamed, but we still were gracious. Uh, we're made the, as the filth of the world. He says, look, people want to treat us like dirt? Have at it. We don't care. We don't mind being nobodies. If you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just a couple of pages past 1 Corinthians, then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he continues with this theme. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 4, 10, <clears throat> Paul says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. I'm in 2 Corinthians 4.10. Paul said, I, I carry the death of Christ in me all the time. I'm dying every day. I'm willing to die in every situation. You have your will, I'm willing to die and let you have your way. Look at verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. Now let me explain. As long as Bruce Goddard is alive, Jesus can't live in this body. Am I saved? Yes. Does the Spirit of God live inside me? Yes. But understand this, according to what we just read there, that if I do not die to Bruce Goddard, Jesus can't live inside. So over here, I surrender my will, I surrender my desires, I surrender my, my wishes, my passions, my longings, I surrender my comfort, I surrender uh, the things that I really believe that I'm going to hang on to, and I surrender all of it, Jesus can live here because Bruce Goddard's dead. But if I'm over here self-exalting, protecting me and standing up for me and defending me and, and honoring me, uh, Jesus can't move into that thing because the vessel is full of Bruce Goddard. And in order for Christ to be manifest, look at that verse again, verse, verse 11, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. If, if we don't die, he doesn't live. Can't happen. Jesus said, except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth fruit. And until I am willing as a Christian man to die to my petty whims and my selfish preferences, Christ can't live in me because I'm too busy living in myself. Romans 8.36 says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. See, if I could just take a minute and talk about the wonders of being dead, and, and I mean dead to yourself, you, you go out to the mortuary, um, find somebody in a hearse, somebody in the mortuary ready for burial. Um, you know what? A, a dead person has no problem saying they're sorry. It's humbling, but there's no pride in a dead person. A dead person's got no problem 
um, about saving with saving faith. So I'm worried about what people will think of me. You know what? Dead people aren't worried about what people think about them. And a, a church full of people who've, who have died to self and said, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about the, that's, that's like, and I, this is a simple illustration, but colors of our building and colors of carpet and colors of pews. We just need pews. I don't care. I just don't want them pink. I care, I care a little. But, um, you know, we, we remodel and redecorate, try to stay nice with things. But, you know, I don't, I, I know of churches that have split over the color of carpet people bought. That's why none of you got to vote on the color of the carpet. We just took a big thing of all kinds of carpet, closed your eyes, threw a dart, and that's the one we put down there. Do you know, and that's, I'm joking, but, and if, and if you don't like the color of the carpet, you're not dead. <laughs> dead people don't care. Uh, but since there's a lot of live people come to our church, we, re we really do work at trying. We're, we're, in the, we're in a remodeling process, I guess you know that since we've got three different colors in the auditorium. <laughs> We're just trying to find something to look right, then we'll stick with it. You know, dead people don't get offended. You can go to the mortuary and look at somebody and say, man, your hair looks bad. They don't care. Dead people don't get offended. Dead people have no problem with those who think differently with them than them. You know, you like that and I like this. Two dead people, you never see two dead people arguing over their preference between Taco Bell and McDonald's. Because if they're saved, they're in heaven and they're eating Taco Bell. It's not a problem. <laughs> you know, dead, just think about soul winning, passing out gospel tracts, witnessing. You know, dead people aren't embarrassed. It's only a man filled with self that gets embarrassed. Now, understand, I'm not preaching at anybody. I'm trying to give us all some goals because I'm the first one to admit I really am full of self. I, I fight it. You know, it's one of those things you push it out here and it goes shoop, and it sucks right back in there. <laughs> and I think, man, how can I be so full of someone that I don't even like sometimes? Um, you know, a person who was, who was dead would forgive those who hurt him. Wouldn't even think about it. A dead person cannot have their emotions and their feelings hurt. A dead person is not worried about self-esteem. A dead person doesn't worry about rejection. A dead person uh, is relaxed in dangerous situations. A dead person can go to Vanuatu as a missionary and not even worry about it. Uh, a dead person can, you know, a dead person doesn't remember that someone was mean to them. They can honestly, I, I know people who've carried a grudge. And again, I've not been hurt like some people have. And I understand that. But I remember years ago, we just started our church. I was young, 25. And we met this lady and she started, I knocked on her door, she started coming. I preached one night on forgiveness. And she said, she came up to me after the service, 20 people probably in the church that night, 30 people maybe. And she said, Pastor, I just want you to know, somebody hurt me, and I don't know, years ago. And she said, and I'm not about to forgive them. I said, well, you know, that's between you and God. It's not my problem. But I thought, isn't that a shame? Do you know the Bible really does say, if you don't forgive he won't forgive you. Now we're not talking about forgive, salvation forgiveness. We're talking about right with God forgiveness. First John 1, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And my name's in heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. That's all settled. But in my pos there's, there's positional righteousness. I am righteous before God because I'm saved. But there is practical righteousness here on earth. Positional righteousness is vertical. Practical righteousness is between me and my, my brethren. And if I have a bitter spirit toward a brother and I cannot forgive that wrong, then I break this thing. Not salvation. I just break anything I can have with God. Because God says if you cannot love your brother who you can see... How can you love God who you cannot see? And I know there's been people heard in here a lot more than I have, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God says forgive. See, a dead man can forgive. The word surrender is a great word when we talk about dying to self. Brother Valdez, our Spanish pastor, boy, you ought to go up there. If you're bilingual, you ought to visit our Spanish church on Sunday night. It's wild. 
This was very calm tonight. They are wild up there. And um, Brother Bell just pastored 14 years at a very good church in Alhambra. Had a building paid for, a house paid for, money in the bank. Everything was fine. But he just knew God wanted to move him. And we talked over a series of months. And he ended up coming here. Do you know he and Mrs. Valdez have stepped in and have never one time, even the slightest bit, been a problem following going from leadership to fellowship that's just that's dead people do that mrs valdez was the ladies leader the voice of the women in their church she had no problem coming here and and just being a great member of the church she helps the spanish department of course see the word surrender is when you say i give up me i'm done with me i don't matter just whatever you want is fine it's Romans chapter 12, if you want to look back there, we're in Corinthians. Go back a few pages, and many of you have memorized it, but uh, if you haven't, if you want to look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. If you're still looking, keep looking. We'll come back to it. But Paul said this, I want you to pick up your body, and I want you to bring it to me, and I want you to lay it down there, your body. He's talking about your body now. We are very much in love with our bodies, aren't we? You know, you, you go buy clothes, you know what the first thing you do when you get those clothes on? How do I look in these clothes? Do these things make me look, and you fill in the blank, whatever you want. <laughs> There's one word used more than others, but I'm very concerned now <laughs> i have a friend and uh, we were out of town and where we were where we were somebody's buying both of us a suit years ago 20 years ago probably and he was short and stocky and he just loved the look of a double-breasted suit and he asked the guy you know Can, hey show me double-breasted suits and i'm looking thinking you don't want that man that's gonna make you look fat <laughs> i didn't say a word if he wants to look fat god bless him he didn't say, how does this make me look? I just, he, I just stood there and said, that's a dumb choice. But anyway, not my business. But, but most of us are concerned. But, but the Lord says, I want you to take your body and lay it there and say, whatever you want to do with it, God, that's yours. That body is yours. Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Then look at those next words, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God says, you make that body holy and you lay it down right there and then you leave it there because that body's mine. The song is you're all on the altar of sacrifice laid. Your heart does the spirit control. There ought to be in the Christian life a surrender. And I can tell you the battle that many of us face is a battle of spirit and flesh it's a battle of dying to self or loving self it's i don't I, you know i just can't see me out knocking on doors telling people about god oh well it's all about you i guess then huh and again this is not me talking to you this is me preaching to the air i you know i i just don't know if i could just pray and talk to God. Hey, he's good. He'll listen to you. Talk to him. You don't know where I've been, what I've done. He already knows. Talk to him. He's God. He wants to hear from you. Teenagers, God wants to hear from you. Many of the teens have been with me at camp, and we've been on our knees for an hour, 30, 40 minutes or longer on our knees. You've been there. God wants to talk to you. God wants to hear from you. That's surrendering yourself. It's humbling yourself. This thing about this battle to protect me, to make me, do people appreciate me? Dead people don't need to be appreciated. Dead people just go where they're put. You know, you put that suit on them, put those clothes on them, they don't care. Over to 2 Corinthians again, back over where we, where we were. Just tonight, we're, we're, uh, we're in a world that is just clinging to image and esteem, and, and it's so unscriptural. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look down at verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 
Oh, I thought, man, that's the wrong verse. I'm in 1 Corinthians 11. There we go. 2 Corinthians 11. I knew, I knew that wasn't right. That looks much better. Are they ministers? People were telling the Corinthian church that Paul was not such a hot shot. And why are they following him? And, and Preachers have always been a pain in the neck. I don't know why. Just let me apologize for pastors, okay? I don't know what to say. Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? And look at this. I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. And look at this. In deaths oft. Paul said, I die regularly. He said, I die daily, meaning every day he's willing to, to crucify himself. But Paul did die at Lystra when they stoned him. And, and you know, just, just think about this. If you could lose yourself, a dead man doesn't care where he lives. In the Philippines, Haiti, Iraq. And by the way, you young men, you, you want to serve God someday, especially you want to go to the mission field, you better marry a girl who's dead. Some girl who's got her image of her cute little house and her cute little picket fence and her cute little fuzzy doggy and her cute little three cars in the driveway. And better get over that. You better marry a dead girl if you're going to take her across the world and serve God. Now, I've got pictures of Liz, Pan Liz Panero. That's Philip Panero's son, Jeremy, his wife. And she's got those three or four little blonde girls. You talk about a lady who's dead. And uh, I, I've got Bet Brett and Jen Beal. I've got pictures of, of uh, Jen in Africa. And they're, they're braiding her hair like they do the natives' hair. And natives holding those kids like they're their own. And, you know, you I tell you, you're going to have to take those kids and put them on that altar too. Because you're all on the altar of sacrifice laid. I remember years ago, Josiah was a baby. He's 16 now. And Jen and Justin Soto, they were on our staff at the time. Jet, Justin was one of our teens. He's pastoring now. And by the way, they just had their third anniversary. Great day up there in Sacramento, a new church, River City Baptist. And, and uh, our uh, Josiah and their uh, oldest is Abigail. Abigail's the same age. And they're in the church nursery together, same age. I've never, in 32 years, never heard of this happening. We picked up Josiah, they picked up Abby. We're walking out of church and, and Jen looks down in her diaper bag and sees Josiah's bottle in her bag, empty. And the bottles are labeled. And realize Abby's bottle is in our bag, empty. And then the shock and the horror that my kid drank someone else's bottle. Now for us as the fourth child, we didn't care. <laughs> It's just Josiah. <laughs> but for the Sotos, that was firstborn. You know how you are. Firstborn baby, that pacifier touches nothing. If air blows across it, you take it back to the sterilizer and you sterilize it, you know. Fourth child, you drop the pacifier on the floor, wipe it under your arm, put it back in their mouth. <laughs> I wonder, do your kids belong to God? I mean, I, it's just a question. See, losing yourself or dying to yourself is huge when we start talking about Christianity. Paul said, I die all the time because every time there's a conflict brewing, I've got to die. Of course, that one time with him and Barnabas, they didn't die real good. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, right? See, a dead man doesn't care. Jesus, look over to Matthew chapter 10. I'm just doing a Bible study with you for my devotions this evening. And, and I want to try and get you some, just some thoughts on, on life. We've got to win this battle. How can I do what I'm supposed to do and be what I'm supposed to be while I'm full of bruise? The most deadly thing I can do is be filled up with me. Because as long as I'm filled up with me, I can't be filled up with Christ. I'm worried about fitting in and am I reaching people in the right way and am I up to snuff? You know what? I'm worried about pleasing God and loving this book and that's all that really matters. You know, once you, once you get 100 years old, you don't care what anybody else thinks. Matthew 10, you there? 
Look at verse 39. He that findeth his life shall what? Lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You wanna, you're, you're traveling down the road of life, especially young people, listen to me now. You're going down life and you want a happy life, a fulfilled life, an enjoyable life. You want to love life. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting to love life. James says, he that will love life and see good days, let him, and he has a list of things to do. I want to love life. I do love life. I enjoy life. But I don't know anything I do I don't enjoy. I did golf last year. I didn't enjoy that. I enjoyed being with the men. It was that I was holding a metal rod in the middle of a grass field in a thunderstorm. And the ball never would go where I wanted it to go. <laughs> Stupid little ball. <laughs> but, but I do. I love life. I enjoy life. But if you want to step up, you want to get down the road enjoying life and loving life, you're going to have to quit. You're going to have to quit on you. He that will love his life. He says, if you don't, in verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it. You spend every decision you make clinging to your life. I promise you, you will die inside. Can I tell you, ladies, one of the ways to destroy your happiness is to cling so tightly to life that everything's about you. Your security and your happiness and how you want this and how you want that. You look scripturally at your role and the world does not center around you. That's not scriptural. He that, the end of verse 39, he that will lose if his life for my sake shall find it. Look at that woman in Proverbs sometime and see her. She rises up while it is yet night. She provides food. She finds a field. She buys it. She plants. She sells. She sows. She sells what she sowed. She, she gives to the poor. She cares for others. She's a giver, a worker. This girl is going night and day. Her family's clothed with scarlet, working to make it all happen. Her husband is known in the gate. He's the one who's well known. She's not. But get to the end of the chapter. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he prays with her. You know why? Because it wasn't all about her. You men, the same thing. You, you, you try building that marriage on everything being happy. And if I'm not happy, we're going to make everybody else miserable. That is no way to have a good marriage. The happiest marriage in the world is when two people lock arm in arms and crawl into the hearse together and say, we're dead. Whatever God wants, whatever he wants for me, his will, his will I must do. Wherever he wants me to be, his will, his will I must, his will I must go. You've got to get over you. Ask my kids, ask my wife, what would dad like? I guarantee you none of them could tell you. Ask me. I like chocolate. <laughs> dark lit, dark chocolate. 70, 80% cocoa. I like Taco Bell. <laughs> what do you want? I like my car. It's no payments. I like my truck. There's no payments. I'd like my house better if there were no payments. <laughs> I like my church. See, why have you stayed here all these 32 years? Because no one ever gave me a chance to go anywhere else. <laughs> See, oh, it's so good you've stayed. Checks keep clearing and nobody's invited me to go anywhere else. He repeats that same verse in John 12, 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto it life eternal. Dead people don't mind if the food is bad. Dead people don't mind if the laundry is undone. I know I'm getting close to meddling here. Uh, I'll just say this. If I go to the drawer, this is an if. If I go to the drawer, it's been my rule for decades. If I go to the drawer and I take the last pair of socks out, I go to the store, I go to Walmart that day, and for three bucks I get more socks. I'm not fighting with my wife over a three buck pair of socks. I've, had, I've heard men just furious at their wives. The laundry's not done. Hey, you're a big boy. Do the stinking laundry. What's your problem? Now me, I won't. I'll go to the store and buy more. Because my wife is a tight woman. And she can't even imagine me going to buy more socks when the dirty clothes is full of them. So she will keep that drawer full of socks. I'm not stupid. 
But I'm not going to fuss. I, no way. If the, oh, my wife, a man one time said, man, all my wife, my wife just knows I just want certain kind of milk in the fridge. You're fighting over what kind of milk? Hey, the John's Dairy is right there. Buy it yourself. Well, I think she ought to, I think she ought to too, but you know what? She's not very smart. She married you. If she was smarter, she wouldn't have married you. She married a guy that knows how to milk a cow himself. I don't know. <laughs> Dead people don't fight. And again, I mentioned Paul and Barnabas. I'm not, I'm not picking on you if you fought. We're going to. We're flesh. I would like to say my flesh never rises. You know, you know who gets me? Strangers get me. Twice in the last six, eight months, I've been in a position where strangers approach me and just caught me off guard and started lipping off and about our church or about, not about me, but about our church, about our philosophy, about Christianity. And you know, all of a sudden you start swelling up with self-righteous and, and then I go, Poof. it's like the devil says, oh, some Christian you are. And I think, well, not all the time, but <laughs> I hate it. I hate it when I get out. Because when I blow, it's me blowing out. It's just evident that I got so full of me. You know, Jesus, it says that as a lamb, as a sheep is dumb before his shears, he opened not his mouth. Man, I hate it when that happens. Philippians 1, 20 and 21. Look over there. I'll just show you one more verse, and we're going to end a minute or two early here for tonight. But then I can show you one more verse. Dr. Howes used to say, I found out a long time ago, I love the ending of a sermon, so I end for a long time. But uh, Philippians 1.20, Paul says in Philippians 1.20 and 21, according to my earnest expectation, his, his earnest, he's longing for this, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body. Look at this phrase, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said, I only want one thing. If I die, let Christ be glorified. If I live, let Christ be glorified. It just doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. I just want God happy. See, dead people don't worry about their clothes. Nobody's fussing. You mean I got to wear that? You mean I can't wear that? No dead person ever said that. Dead people don't worry if their phone sparkles. Teenagers. Oh, you want me to use this stupid phone? People will laugh. Don't show it to anybody. Dead people don't show off their phones. Oh, I can't believe, I was talking to a parent recently and I suggested there's, there are phones that, that just have three pre-programmed numbers and you just push one to that, two to that, three to that, and then they'll dial 911. I think all the teenagers ought to have a phone like that. Mom, dad, and pastor. Or youth pastor. Or, you know, welfare, whatever. Oh, I, I just don't know what I could do if I don't have my phone so I can Instagram and text and Facebook. That's probably all windows into garbage. I, I, don't, I don't even think teenagers ought to carry phones unless they're out doing something where they need it and everybody's got to make their own rules. I did talk to a whole bunch of our parents about rules for driving, by the way. I see more teenagers driving right now. I, I talked about a dozen of our men said, and men and ladies and said, what were the rules when your kids started driving? I have that if you want it. Uh, you teenagers will love it. <laughs> Dead teenagers don't mind when their parents put rules in their driving. 1 Corinthians 15, 31 says, I protest by your rejoicing. I die daily. I die daily, Paul said. In John 12, 24, I mentioned earlier, except the corn and wheat, uh, fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. Um, you know, no dead man worries about somebody writing a check. Dead men don't seek the pleasures of this world. Dead men aren't seeking a name for themselves. Dead men don't care if they're popular or unpopular. Dead men don't want uh, people happy because a dead Christian's with God and all they want is God happy. The best Sunday school teachers in our church are those people who forget themselves. I watched Sharon Tiller up here and Sharon and Bob moved some years ago, but 
I watched Sharon Tiller stand here, and this room was packed with children. I'm going to say twice as many people as there are right now because we're talking about little kids. It was full of children. She had every kid on the edge of their seat. You know how she did it? She forgot all about Sharon. She was so wrapped up in teaching that lesson. I mean, Sharon, she has no regard for, for Sharon at all. But she may be the best Sunday school teacher I've ever heard. Galatians 2.20 says this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Could I ask you tonight, ask yourself, who are you full of? You feel of you or you're full of Jesus? And you can't be full of Jesus unless you're empty of you. Uh, one of my complaints, and I'm not picking, I don't want to ruin your night by saying this word. <laughs> one of my gripes about unions is all about us. And I know, I don't know enough, but I know you got of this and you can't that and you can't work here without a union or whatever. And, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on you. I'm telling you, this, the union system is all about me you know right wrong whatever but it is strikes it's all about me it's a mess we're in a mess teacher strikes law enforcement strikes air traffic controller strikes you know if we could just forget about us the, the idea, my wife is not meeting my needs. Hey, why don't you just die? No dead man ever said that. I just want to give up my will. As your pastor, I have a handful of things that I was taught, and I will cling to those because they're these things. But other than those things, I don't really care. And pink, we're going to not have that. <laughs> Uh, look, if you weren't at the game, the other team the other night, all their socks were pink all the way from shoe to knee, and these boys. The girls were in black, the girl cheerleaders and all, and I thought, you know what, put the girls in pink. What's wrong with this thing? You say, well, it's cancer awareness. Well, let the girls be aware. I just, I, anyway, I'm going to have a shirt. I hate pink, and then a small print on boys. But, you know, someone who has a shirt, I'm man enough to wear pink. Well, I'm smart enough to not. <laughs> I don't know anyone in the room wearing pink. If you are, I am so sorry because dead men don't offend people. <laughs> it's more green and orange in here. Die to self and you will live for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, help us tonight to be aware of how wicked and selfish I am. And as long as I'm puffed up full of me, I cannot be full of Jesus. I pray you'd help us to leave our all on the altar of sacrifice, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Lord, this morning started early. We had bus workers here early. We had Sunday school teachers here early, long before 8 o'clock. We had many, many people on the property and already off. And those are people who just chose to die to their self all morning. And nursery workers who pl planned on being at church, but they were in the nursery. And and teachers of Sunday school classes and folks, folks spent their Sunday afternoon at the jail and the rest home bringing church to those who don't have church. Lord, may we live that way at the stoplight, at the break room. May we live that way at home in the kitchen. May our children learn to put others first. Help us to die to our own wishes, our own dreams. May the words, I don't care, be common words. May the words, whatever you'd like, be, the, be familiar terms. Help us, please, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for a moment of invitation.